So thanks a lot and thank you very much for the invitation to this meeting here. So as an answer, I would like to talk about um, uh, some derivation of the Vlasov equation, which effectively describes the dynamics of um, many particles in the V coupling limit. And uh, to get to that goal, I would like to focus today, as you can read in the abstract, on different notions of convergence. So the idea is a little bit more to present the ideas behind the proof, how these different notions of convergence could be used to derive this Vlasov equation and which statements hold true, which statements hold not true. In parts it's also technical, that for some technical reasons is good to look at the right notion of convergence, although other notions might be true also, but it might be technically hard to prove that. And to start with, I would like to start with these different notions of convergence I would like to discuss today. And then I would like to introduce this microscopic system and uh, give you the respective statements on uh, how you can uh, prove that there is some effective evolution equation describing this system. So here, the notions of conversion. I would like to introduce and uh, assume you have some, some space, some sample space omega. <coughs> and I would like to talk about kinds of different notions of convergence. Now you need not have a p particular system in mind that's just some, some uh, general definitions or repetitions, which of course you had in your probability class, but I think it's, it's good to have them at hand. Something I would like to call deterministic. If for each omega, in my sample space, one has to get used to use chalk again, right? For each omega in the sample space, it holds that the limit n to infinity of x and omega is some x of omega. That's the deterministic convergence, or what I will call deterministic in this case here. You don't need to have to talk about probability measures and all that. You have some set, you have objects in the set, and there you have this kind of convergence. So what I will, the next uh, notion of convergence you all know from your probability class is almost sure convergence. Of course, this x is a random variable, this, this uh, x ends r is a sequence of random variables. More details will come in this proof for the, uh, the special setting I want to discuss. There's almost sure convergence. You know that this is the statement that the limit n to infinity x n equals r. I wanted to use the notion y for some reason. Sorry for that. Y is equal to 1. The third one <coughs> I would like to discuss is convergence and probability. That's of course yeah, that the distance between x n and x, uh, sorry, y is yeah, larger than epsilon goes to zero as n tends to infinity. Now this is, of course, a real number. So you have this kind of convergence. I will need a little bit of space because I would like to say more about the convergence and probability later. So I leave some space here. And the fourth, fourth notion is convergence and distribution. Well, there's, uh, I call, could say, convergence in distribution for all kinds of weak, weak notions of convergence. And you know there is uh, this equivalent statement to the uh, yeah, traditional definition of convergence in distribution, which says, of course, that the distribution functions converge on all points where the distribution function of the y is continuous. You can also have this weak convergence, so that's saying that the expected 
of f if you take the xn of f y n for any f's in some I use the letter n for some nice functions. For example, here you could use continuous in Lipschitz, or you can change that set. I will come to that later, just uh, to make the notions clear. Now, in this talk, I will not distinguish between really convergence of a sequence xn to uh, uh, yeah, uh, point uh, y. I will also use uh, the notion convergence in a little bit more dirty way that I put something like yn here. So from time to time, in particular when I talk about convergence in probability, I will have two different sequences which approach each other, but how to generalize these statements. I think this is crystal clear. So if I sometimes talk about convergence, but mean just two different sequences which approach each other, I think it's clear what I mean by that. And that's also true for all these types of convergences. So I will come back to that and make things more precise. This is just recalling these different notions, which will play an important role in this talk. And as you know, I went from the strongest to the weakest. And um, now I would like to come to the system I want to discuss. And uh, the system I would like to discuss is n bodies, which are evolved with respect to Newtonian dynamics. And I want to write to yeah, Radov equation. So I want to talk about the derivation of the Vlasov equation from the microscopic picture. So I will have a microscopic system. This microscopic system. Can you read when I write here? Can, can you see, see that on the camera? OK. Uh, so my microscopic systems will be n particles subject to Newtonian dynamics. And I will use the following notation and letters. Uh, the no, the oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, we don't see. You don't see it. OK, I'll try to shift a bit. OK. So the letter I will use for the trajectory is xt. This will depend on n. So the particle number of the system, I will not always write all the indices. Often I will drop this uh, index n, just when it's important, I will uh, recall uh, it. So I use the letter q for the position and the letter p for the momentum of the particle. Now, all masses in my system will be equal. So I will say, I said all masses equal to one. So velocities and momenta are just the same thing. So p is the velocity or momentum, and q is the position. And um, I will also use, uh, well, I will use capital letters for the position of the n particles. And I will use the letter q, t1, q, t2, and so on for the single entries, p, t1, and so on. So small letters describing the position of one particle, capital letters for the collection. And of course, you see each of these will be in R3. So my dimension will be 3. This can be easy, easily generalized. So all statements can be generalized to other dimensions. When the dimensions get interesting, I will say a few, few words. But just think of d equal to 3. So these q's and the pti live in R3. So this is a trajectory now defined on the n-body phase space. And this is what I want to look at. Now, I said it's subject to Newtonian uh, dynamics, which means that uh, q t i dot is, of course, given by the velocity. So the change in the position is given by the velocity of the ith particle. And now there's a force in the system. And I assume the pardon? Uh, has not. Uh, the, thanks a lot. So uh, there's a force in, in the system, and I assume that there is pair interaction in the weak coupling situation. So that means the derivative of the velocity is given by 1 divided by n. This is the number of particles in the system. And um, now I use the sum 
um, j not equal to i, and I use some force qi minus qj, of course, always at time t. Now, from the physical point of view, you might say, well, this is uh, questionable to assume such kind of a system. Because increasing the particle numbers, it doesn't change the coupling constant of your force. Well, these systems can be argued for by just changing to different scales of the system. So my scale will be that the volume, so the intermediate distance, so probably the scale will be such that, that the volume of the gas is of order one. So all length, uh, the length uh, scale, which means the intermediate distance between two arbitrary particles is, uh, is of order one. And um, the point is now, as I said, well, this uh, looks a little bit artificial to have this weak coupling, but if you say, okay, in fact, you have a system which has a large volume and you just use the unscaled situ uh, the, 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 the situation with, with a fixed coupling constant, you can rescale it to a smaller volume and you get this kind of equations of motion. Or in other words, well, you take n to be large, well, the positions, when I talk about the positions, that might be the position of stars forming a galaxy. And uh, you could assume that the true galaxy grows in size when you put more stars into it. And then if you rescale everything su such that it has a fixed radius, then you can arrive at a rescaled system where the coupling constant now gets n independent, which is not a surprise. So there's good explanations that this is in fact very physical to put this recoupling here for such a system. Well, in my talk, I will not distinguish between repulsive and attractive cases. So you could think of stars forming a galaxy where the interaction is attractive. You could think about a plasma where uh, the electrons repel each other. This will not make any change for today's talk. And now I would like to write down the effective description of that, which is the Vlasov equation. So that's the macroscopic description of my uh, system. And uh, here, if you look at the system and you do some uh, yeah, heuristic guessing how these guys here evolve, you arrive at the following idea. So this is the typical idea you get from from the mean field situation. Now, I will assume some probability. So later, my omega will be phase space. The initial position of my particles will be at random. I will assume that they are IID, the particles. And if I assume a time equal to zero, the particles are IID with respect to some, some row zero. So you assume that some row zero is given. That's some initial density. Now I assume I put my particles into the system IID with respect to this row zero, this density on phase space. So this is a density on phase space. So it goes from R6 to the non-negative uh, reals. And is of course, the integral is equal to 1. That's a density. And if you assume and put your particles into the system, you know that the law of large numbers tells you that the empirical density of particles is more or less, if you look at the empirical density, so where the particles are setting in some yeah, weak way, looking at in some, some rough manner, it draws the picture of rho zero with a very, very large probability. So deviations from that is, of course, happens with small probabilities. And then if you look at the interaction, if you have to say, okay, what's the interaction this particle here encounters? Well, it gets this sum of all the interaction terms from the other particles. Now, let's say this is particle number one. So you have QT1, it interacts with all the other particles. Given the position of particle one, the other th others are all still IID, independent from the first particle. So the, you can average uh, this interaction, you can replace uh, the true value of that by the expectation value. That's what the law of large numbers tells you. So what you see is that the force is in good approximation f of, let's say this is particle number one, for example, qt1 minus q. If you look at time zero, uh, 
is in good approximation if we assume that the system is IID by the convolution in the Q coordinate of the force with the density. So with this I mean the following. With this convolution, this is defined in the following way. So I integrate F at the position, let's call that, yeah, that's just an integration variable, let's call that Y, rho times of the variables Q01 minus Y, comma P. Let's put that here, X d3y d3x. So you integrate out the, velo the vari variable describing the velocity, so you just look at the, the density projected to the position, right? So you integrate out all velocities and then you make the ordinary convolution. That's not surprising because I assume that the interaction is independent of the velocity difference. I assume that the velocity is irrelevant, so I just look at the density profile in ordinary space and then I take the convolution to get this uh, kind of behavior. Now this holds for t equal to 1 and of course the tricky part is to show that this here survives propagation that also after some time this approximation is valid and uh, this is of course something one has to be estimated and as very often for such uh, situations the error estimates are simple. The, the tricky part is the propagation of errors. Right? So assuming that there is some, initially it's IID to, to, to prove the law of large numbers and, and to control this difference here is of course, uh, I would say it's textbook probability theory. So to estimate this error here is, is easy to do, but the propagation of errors, which means if you have an error, error term already and particles start to get correlated, how this infects other particles, that's typically the more tricky part of these proofs. And um, here one has a hint that this uh, could work, which is the following, right? So here you have a pair interaction. I have chosen this factor here such that the interaction term is of order one. So the volume will be of order one in phase space, so the typical velocity differences will be of order one, the position differences are of order one, everything is of order one. This force term now is of order one, let's assume there's no singularity for the moment. Um, this force term, term is of order one, so this is a leading order effect on, on the evolution of the system comes from this force, and it's a pair interaction of force. So one might think, well then correlations are in some sense of leading order. But we see this law of large number tells us that this pair interaction can in very good approximation be replaced by one particle term only. So this is like an external field. So the leading order of this interaction does not lead to correlation. That's the thing, right? When you do law of large numbers, you integrate out this one variable and you have, an, yeah, it's like an external field. So you assume that uh, after some time it should still be IID. So the f uh, correlations should be small and then the question is, sufficiently small that you can control the propagation of errors and how these small uh, correlations uh, can be controlled and they do not blow up in a sense by infecting other particles. Now that's uh, the situation and I would like now to talk at the same time about known results and connect that to this uh, 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 blackboard on the side where I talk about um, these different no notations and I would like to start with some old results well these go back to Neunzeit Wick Braun and Hepp It's from the 70s. There's a few more people to, 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 to mention. There's a very nice paper from Dobrushin. I would like to, to write him down. I like the Dobrushin paper a lot about that. Also, there's a contribution by Herbert Spohn from the 80s and so on. But uh, these are the earliest results. And these results, they make the following assumption. <coughs> 
F is, glo is globally Lipschitz. So they have a global Lipschitz assumption on F, and they get a deterministic result. Deterministic result in the following sense. So as long as rows, these uh <coughs> um, uh, density of my particles at time zero, I call this the empirical density of my trajectory at zero. I will not give the details, I will say something about the details. It's given by this row zero. It follows that my empirical density at xt is Luffy given by the Vlasov equation. Now what is the Vlasov equation? So the Vlasov equation now is the following uh, situation. Now you take the density. Yes? Uh, is xt is, is the full uh, position and velocity or so only the, the position? I mean in your last simulation. Pardon? There, rho is the full uh, uh, <coughs> distribution function or only the spatial density? The, you mean the empirical row? Yeah. I would like to define it. So here, here, here. X is plus P and Q. This X0 is defined as the sum of the deltas. So as, as a function of Q and P is defined as the sum of the deltas of yeah, the pair QP with the pair QTI and PTI. And I sum over all i going from 1 to n. And I want to normalize the density such that it is, uh, has norm 1. So this is the empirical density. This is what I would like to call empirical density. And this row here, this row t, is a solution of the Vlasov equation. So what's, uh, how does uh, the Vlasov equation look like? So now, uh, so this row t solves the following equation. So now if you look at the system which we have, we have this initial density profile rho zero which was given and my particles were iid. And each particle is now more or less subject to this force which I called f star rho. And I assume that this holds also for later times. And now if you now go do the following, if you follow the trajectory of one of these particles to describe how the density profile looks at a later time, uh, you have a Liouville th theorem also on the one-body level. That's because of the idea that my pair interaction now is effectively, effectively like an external force, right? So you can, in good approximation, use Liouville's theorem just looking at the one-body level, which, of course, for interacting system is, in general, something which does not work. But on the, here, in good approximation, this should be true. We just assume that it's true. Well, the Vlasov equation for me now is just an ansatz. I will rate, later prove that my true uh, system really is described by Vlasov. That comes uh, later in the talk. And then you can follow the trajectories. And due to Liouville, along the trajectories, these density pro will profile will just stay constant. So the total time derivative of this row, if you follow the one of these trajectories, if you follow the trajectories, so Q and P is just uh, yeah, one of these candidates is, this is the un ansatz, is equal to zero. And that means, of course, that the partial time derivative of this row, which will now be time dependent, is equal, yeah, the derivative with respect to q times q dot. Well, q dot is, of course, given by p plus the derivative with respect to, q, to p times p dot. And p dot now is, uh, is replaced by this f star rho qp.
So this way you arrive at this uh, kind of Lazov equation here. And you see it's a nonlinear equation in rho. Rho shows up quadratically here in this uh, second summand. And in this talk I will not say too much about the solution theory of this equation. So there's uh, existence, uh, uh, global, uh, uniqueness in global existence, even for the F being Coulomb uh, under yeah, fair conditions on the initial state is, is well known already. So I will just assume that there is some solutions and I will want to assume are, are the signs? The signs are um, ah. Yes, I think you're right. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, I would just assume that there's some uh, solutions exist, so that I will assume even integrating in the p-coordinate well, this here stays bounded for all times. Well, as I said, if, uh, if your initial row has some yeah, compact support in the compact support in the velocity coordinate, one can even show for Coulomb that um, this can be yeah, propagated in time and you get solutions like that. But I will not talk about existence and uh, uniqueness of solutions. I will just assume that here. Now, this is a, a nice result, and the question one has now is how to generalize this result. And of course, the problem with this result is the following, that it assumes a global Lipschitz condition on the force term, but the forces we are interested in are typically Coulomb forces. Because... Excuse me. Yes. Clear to me. What do you mean by this curve equal? So, you mean some limit? Um, ah, yeah, this is... Uh, I would like to... Okay, come to that. Uh, okay, good. Good that you're asking. So, now, the question is... In which sense are these two guys uh, close to each other? It's in some limit. And there's, of course, different notions of limits you can use here. What you can do is you can take the Wasserstein distance, for example, between this uh, empirical density, which, of course, defines a Radon measure. So you can take uh, the, uh, some notion of distance between two measures here and show that after some time t, you still have closeness in that notion of distance. I wouldn't, didn't want to go too much into details in these notions of distances because I would like to focus on a few things which are a little bit simpler. I'm not sh sure if uh, everyone in the audience is familiar with these Wasserstein distances. That would, might require a little bit longer, but in that sense, uh, it's, uh, I assume that the limit here in the Wasserstein distance is rho zero, and here then I show that it's rho t. Good point. Okay. So this is, these are the deterministic results, and, and the drawback here is that uh, I'm not so much interested in globally Lipschitz forces. The most interesting cases are Coulomb, both attractive and repulsive. If you think about uh, uh, yeah, gravitation or electro, uh, electric interaction repulsion, then it's a Coulomb system. And the point now is the big goal is to take F Coulomb. This is, uh, until today, an open problem. So now deriving these mean field limits for these classical systems is uh, something hard to do and a little bit more tricky than in the quantum systems in the following sense. In the quantum system you have the Laplace which smoothens out uh, the system a little bit so that makes it a little bit easier. Of course then you can ask more difficult questions on the system so that's not saying that mean field limits on quantum system is per se easier but if you look at the same system for example Coulomb interaction the v-coupling limit I could give a rigorous talk in an hour I could in one hour give the full rigorous proof showing that this works for the Coulomb case um, so that's quite uh, e relatively easy to do, and here it's an open problem, right? So nobody still could solve this for Coulomb systems, with some exception, of course. You could ask, for example, assume that it's just repulsive and you have some monokinetic data. Monokinetic means that the velocity of a particle is a function of its position, and that, uh, yeah, of course, uh, reduces collisions of particles, right? If particles collide, that means they are at the same position with different velocities and things like that. So there are results in this direction. There's a uh, paper I think is, which is very nice by Silvia Sefati, but also from others um, who uh, 
do Coulomb interaction with some other restrictions. I would like, still like to stay in the system where the volume of the gas is fixed and uh, it's a general uh, uh, situation for this initial state. And I would like to extend these results to Coulomb system. And as I said, I'm not able to do that. Nobody is able to do that at the moment. So what you could do is you could say, OK, let's take a few steps which bring us closer to this Coulomb system. So you can introduce either singularities which are a little bit weaker than for the Coulomb, so where the force is not like 1 over Q squared, but it's 1 over Q to some power between, let's say, 1 and 2 or so. And the other thing is would be to do a cutoff. So we do both things, but for this talk, I would like to stay with the cutoff. And um, what I want to do is here, since this is still an open problem, I would like to introduce a cutoff at a certain length scale. And so the system which I want to look like is Fn which is defined in the following way. So it's just the old f, so fn of q is f of q if q is larger or equal to some n to the minus delta. And of course, the role of delta will be very important in this talk. You can have different choices. And I want to get with delta uh, as large uh, as possible to have a relatively small cutoff. And I would like to assume that it's kind of smooth if your yeah, q is larger, uh, is smaller or equal to that, which means that I have some kind of yeah, nice behavior. Smooth here means I need some differentiability of the force, uh, of course, since it's, it's a vector, that means that at zero, the force will be zero, right? But I will go down from, from, from this boundary to zero in a smooth way. I think the details are not so important. What you could do is you could also make a convolution of the force term with a Gaussian, which has uh, a standard deviation given by n to the minus delta. The results would be the same. So this is the force, what I want to look at. And now the first thing is the following question. Now I could say, OK, let me try to prove the theorem. I assume that there is convergence in the Wasserstein distance at t equal to 0. And I just assume such a force term with some delta. And I try to prove um, uh, that there is convergence at a later time. So I will stay at the part 1, right, at the deterministic level. Well, this will fail. There's a guarantee that this will fail because I have an example. There's a simple counterexample which shows that this uh, statement doesn't work anymore if you have this kind of mild singular behavior. Well, it's a singular behavior, of course, now as q goes to zero while n goes to infinity, I still see the singularity. So it's, of course, a milder singularity as yeah, true Coulomb, but still it has some singular behavior now in, in this n to infinity limit. And the example is very simple. So assume you have a kind of, this is now your cloud of particles, and assume you form clusters at t equal to zero. So here I draw the picture of the initial trajectory, so x at point zero, and all these crosses are particles, and I assume that I build clusters. And I assume that the number of particles in that clusters, so the number of clusters, I assume, is 1 divided by epsilon, and the number of particles per cluster is then, of course, given by epsilon times n. And I will choose epsilon as a parameter, and I will look at the li following limit. I want to take the limit n to infinity first, and then epsilon to 0. That's what I want to look at. And the point is, well, if I can. Uh, the question is, can I now prove that for this kind of uh, sequence of initial conditions, I get some kind of yeah, closeness also as time propagates. And to make the picture more clear, it's good to assume that the system is repulsive. Now, I have Coulomb with cutoff, which means the potential energy coming from your partners. I look at the potential energy only from the partners in the cluster, but because that's the leading order. The potential energy. Um, per for each particles, 
is how does it uh, look like? Well, I have this Coulomb with the cutoff. So the potential energy is like 1 over Q with the n minus delta cutoff. So the potential energy term coming from one particle is n to the delta. And I must not forget this 1 over n coupling in front. So sorry, I used small n's before. Don't know why I changed to capital N's here. So the potential energy is that. Well, this is the 1 over n coupling I have. This comes from Coulomb with n to the minus delta cutoff. That's the potential energy coming from one other particles. Now, in the cluster, there's n particles times epsilon I interact with. And now, if you look at that, if you take the n to infinity limit first and then epsilon to zero, this here will go to infinity. If n tends to infinity for any epsilon. So that means the potential energy of a particle, let's say this particle here, the potential energy coming from his friends in his cluster goes to infinity. And now you know what happens. After a very short time, this potential energy will be transferred to kinetic energy and these clusters, they all will explode. And as n to infinity, this explosion will be faster and faster. The outgoing velocities will go to infinity. So you cannot have convergence to a nice solution, which is a priori given of some nice PDE, right? So they cannot approximate this Vlasov equation, and you see that there are initial conditions which have the following property. Now, why do I take these limits? Uh, of course, taking epsilon to zero, it means that the number of clusters is still going to infinity, right? Which means you still have an infinite number of different clusters which enable you to draw the picture of this initial density. So still you can have, weak, in some weak sense, convergence to the row zero, right? If you put your many clusters, one over epsilon, in the right position, it's close in, in terms of epsilon only, of course, not as in, in terms of n, but you, in terms of epsilon, you have closeness of the empirical density at time equals zero to some row zero if you put the clusters in the right positions. So the condition is fulfilled. But you see in the n to infinity, you will have these explosions. So the uh, c conclusion is not fulfilled, so the statement is wrong, right? So here you see that everything gets wrong, and the question is, what can we do? I have a question. Yes, please. Um, so those clusters you had, um, I mean, on the initial condition, you kind of, or, okay, I'm not sure I got this right, but you wanted to start with IIB particles somehow. Yeah, yeah, okay, yes, 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 yes. Um, how does that relate to the cluster? Please? Okay, very good question. Is uh, precisely, this is what I wanted to say now. Now, at the moment, we're still in step number one. Okay. So, there's not really a probability measure. There's just a sample space, and we want... The statement is whenever the right left side is true, the right side is true, without talking about probabilities or ID. And I, I, now I say, okay, I assume that the left is thru, true, I show the right is true, then something like this is, of course, a valid counterexample. So if you want to have a statement which is as strong as these statements, which are deterministic, which hold for any omega, you're lost. And what you say is completely right. So the goal is now to say, OK, let's look at step two or three. Let's introduce the probability measure. And now, of course, these clusters are rare. The probability that you form these clusters if the system is IID is ridiculously small, of course. And therefore, you can exclude that if you prove something like statement two or three. So my message here is, well, one is the strongest. Global Lipschitz forces, it's done. If you want to generalize, you have to do some probabilistic approach. And now what you do is the following, of course. I want to skip part number two for the following reason could say, okay, let's talk about almost show convergence first. But the point is now, if you do, what I will do is convergence in probability. And I want to do error estimates on the system. And you know that if you have good error estimates, you can prove with borel Cantelli or so, you can prove um, con almost show convergence. Well, it's not an IAD situation. So here it's not if and only if. But I think you, you all agree that talking about almost show convergence does not bring any new ingredients to these ideas or is not the right thing to look at. So therefore, I would like to talk about convergence and probability and I left some space here. Because what I would like to remark here is if you talk about convergence and probability, and that's not so clear if you look at the 
textbook version of this convergence is that you have two yeah, parameters which you can tune under this notion. And the two parameters you can tune is the following. The first thing is you can have different notions of distance. So if I talk about uh, convergence in probability, you still have the D and we have different notions of distance and it's important to also discuss the different notions of distance. Well, in the standard textbook examples for these uh, situations, you have random variables which map to some kind of, yeah, let's say a vector space, for example, right? So this x ends go to some, let me put that here on the side maybe. So you have random variables in the textbook version, omega 2, let's say some r, let's say a. And then if you say, okay, all my notions of distance are distance, the distances that come from some kind of norm. You have the equivalence of all norms on that R to the A space. So all these notions, they don't make any change if you talk about these statements of convergence. And that's why there's no, so much, not in the textbook version, there's no, no fuss about the different notions of distance. Like in your analysis two class, there's no notion of different kinds of yeah, uh, notions of continuity, right? Because as long as you have equivalence of norms, everything is fine and you, don't, you can just replace these norms. But here now the situation is different. In our case, we have a situation where we have these trajectories and each trajectory is a trajectory on the n-body phase space. So here, this depends on n. And now, of course, you can't use any equivalence of norm. It will make a difference if your notion of distance between uh, xn and something which I will talk about next is uh, in L infinity or L1 norm, that will make a dis difference. Another thing which is important to note is also in this notion of convergence in probability, another yeah, thing you have to tune is, is the scaling of the situation. Well, mathematically, technically speaking, of course, this could be uh, understood also as a notion of distance, but I would, would like to make this distinction to make this clear. Now, the point is the following. With no different notions of distance, I mean L infinity or L1 or something like that. But then the question is, do I compare these difference between Xn and something else? Yeah, on which scale? On the scale of the full gas? on the scale of the typical distance to the nearest neighbor or even on a smaller scale. So you have different scales where you compare that, can compare that and this is of course something which is important to discuss which means what I will do is I will choose the epsilon to be n dependent because that sets the scale of the system. And what I want to do is the following for this talk it's very nice that from yeah, technical reason, it's very helpful to put the same scale as the cutoff parameter. That's not so surprising if you dig a little bit deeper and it makes the system nice for the following reason. If I compare closeness of uh, something on a scale, which is of the order of the cutoff parameter, that makes sense. Or in other words, if my notion of, of distance is, is finer than that, the result will turn to be not very interesting, right? Because if if I yeah, changed or artificially changed my potential on a, or my force on a certain scale, I think any results which go below that scale are not so very interesting for my taste. But that's just a side remark. The point is, for technical reason, it turns out that choosing this scale and that scale to, to be the same is very helpful in the proof. And now, at the moment, we are still in trouble by convergence and probability, that, so that was what Peter is planning to do, but for what object? Now, what I will do is I will introduce a system which I call X bar, and this is now some uh, system which is again an n particle system, and I will use just let letter, sorry, depends on t and on n, I will just put a bar on every object as I defined it for the trajectories which I have. And now the only difference is the following. So this is again a Newtonian system. So this Q bar dot is given by P bar dot. 
But if I look at the um, velocity of the particles, so the force term, the force term is now not given by uh, the, the fourth of uh, this, this, this uh, n-body interaction. No, it's given by the mean field force. And of course, the position of the particle. Now, remember, this is uh, the guy we've guessed to be the right description of the cloud. So now I just follow, so to say, the characteristics of this Vlasov equation here. And this defines my trajectories. And I assume that x bar at time equal to 0 is the same as x at 0. So I start precisely with the same initial conditions. And now this here is the new auxiliary system. Now, recall. I assume that rho is uh, a nice solution which, which is given, so rho t is given, and given rho t, I know now solve these equations of motion. I want to make this uh, statement because sometimes one has the yeah, impression that just when, only when you know q and p you know what rho is. No, I just solve the Vlasov equation and make the following de definition. And now what I want to prove is the following, or what we could prove is the following. used delta something which is smaller than one third and we could prove the following theorem then we get this almost show convergence and what we can prove is the following what notions of distance do we use well I always use your notion of distance which come from a norm so I look at the true system and compared now with the bar system. And now I use uh, the infinity norm, so the maximum norm on this um, yeah, R6 to, uh, R to the 6n space. And I show that this here is uh, the probability that this is larger. Here I have some time dependent constant, which I can talk about later if you wish some time depending constant but the interesting thing here is now the scales so here I said uh, epsilon which is n dependent so I have uh, uh, thank you n to the minus delta and I can show that this here is bounded by c gamma n to the minus gamma that with this here it means the following for any gamma in R, there exists a C gamma such that, and so on. So this is what I mean by C smaller C gamma n to the minus gamma. So now you see we have uh, uh, this clustering is now excluded because the probability that you have clusters is of course exponentially small. If you look at this uh, this kind of clusters that I introduced here. And of course, then for the initial condition, you can um, assume that there's no clustering. And this is now the result we have. And um, I think I have how much t more time do I have? When did I start? I don't remember. More or less 10 minutes. OK, good. I would like to say a few words on the proof before I go to the other kinds of uh, notions, other notions of convergence. So now you see the scale is interesting. And uh, it's more or less the interparticle distance, right? The, uh, sorry, the distance to the nearest neighbor. So the aver average distance between two particles is, of course, of order one. The yeah, typical distance of a particle to its nearest neighbor is like n to the minus one third in this situation, right? We have uh, three dimensions, density equal to one. So we're close to that uh, distance already. With a little bit of more effort, we can go below that, but this is something I will discuss later. And now I would like to show you how this thing is proven because I refer to this uh, clustering situation and I want to show you how this exclu is excluded. Now you might say, okay, well, initially there's no clusters. I agree. Here you can do, it's everything is IID. Peter can do law of large numbers. Initially there's no clusters. But for the true system, which is very complicated, how can he show that no clusters form at a later time? And this is much easier than one might think. 
And the trick is the following, and I would like to show you the trick how we can exclude clustering at a later time without really uh, doing well. You, the first idea one might have is that you say, okay, I, I collect some initial conditions, and I see, so I propagate my clusters backwards and talk about the initial conditions which lead to cluster at later times and then look at the probabilities. This is what other researchers have done, but this is very tricky and technical to do. What I will do is something very different. I will not do any uh, backwards uh, propagation of the clusters. I will do the following trick. I will just show that for each time t, clustering is rare without naming the initial conditions which lead to clusters. And this is um, much simpler than one might think. And I do it in the following way. So we define a random variable, which I like to call j. And this is the random variable, which looks in the following way. I take the minimum of yeah, this distance, xn minus x bar n, times n to the delta, and 1. So this is now a nice random variable. It gives me uh, this distance times n to the delta. So this distance on, on the right scale, you might say. So I blow it up so it's of order 1 on the respective scale. And I cut it off at 1 once this distance is large. And now what I do is I prove the following lemma. I want to prove that there's a Grünwald kind of estimate for the expectation value of j. So I prove that the dt e of j is bounded by some constant times the expectation value plus, yeah, I call it little o of n. Again, sorry, I don't know why I use capital Ns all the time. So all Ns are small, sorry for that. There's no capital N today. Okay, here the with the derivative, I actually mean uh, some one-sided derivative. So you know that these guys here are continuous so everything is continuous and therefore to uh, get, uh, you want to use then, once you've proven this, you use Grünwald to estimate that this here will be, contro be controllable and for Grünwald it's enough to have a one-sided derivative as long as your function is continuous. Um, that's what, what, what we do, so the goal is to prove this kind of lemma here. Now, I guess everyone is familiar with Grünwald. Now, with having this, uh, this uh, yeah, proven this lemma, the trick to, to control the expectation value of j is rather simple, because you just uh, compare this equation to, to a function f, where f dot is just given by c times f plus this guy. This here you can easily solve by separation of variables. So you get, get a good control of f. And then it's also not difficult to show that f always gives an upper bound for that because these derivatives will be bounded by the derivatives here. Which means with this lemma you can show that there's an exponential growth in time of the error, but it will not grow in n, right? So here this is now the trick one does. And um, now the point is with Grünwald you get a good estimate on j. Now if you look at this, if you have an estimate on j, you of course get an estimate on the probability. And this is the following thing I would like to mention here. The probability xn minus xn bar being large or equal to n to the delta is bounded by this expectation value. Why is that the case? Well, the probability, if this event holds, which we have here, then the j is equal to 1, right? So if this is larger or equal than n to the delta, this is larger than 1. So my result for j is equal to 1. Now the probability that your, your random variable equals 1 is, of course, a low bound for the expectation value for this random variable as long as the random variable itself is non-negative, and that's the case here, right? So the expectation value is this probability times 1 plus other terms, and therefore you get this estimate, and this is what we wanted to prove. Now, in the 
theorem, I gave a little bit more details about the error estimates. Here I just omit these details, so my little o of 1, if you tune it the right way, is, can be made more explicit. But here for the moment, I think, for the general idea, this here is of course nice. I wanted to tell you why this now excludes clustering. Now if you look at the, ex want to prove this uh, theorem, you look at the time derivative of this j. Now, if this here is equal to 1, the time derivative of j, the upper bound for the time derivative is trivial. You have reached the maximum, you can't grow any further. So as long as this distance here is larger than 1, or this object is larger than 1, everything is trivial. So all you have to estimate is the cases where this distance here is smaller than n to the minus delta. Now let's assume n to the minus delta to be the interparticle distance. And now you can show that this excludes clustering for all times. Because, well, we only need to control cases where our x tn minus x t bar n little infinity is bounded by n to the minus delta. Now x bar n is iid, right? The bar system still converts, uh, is, yeah, still um, keeps independence. Everything is iid. Now here you can't form any clusters. So and if I have particles, they are iid. And for each of the particles, it's the infinity norm. I can move that one particle just by n to the one third. It's clear that you cannot build a cluster situation like that. So if you put your particles iid in the gas, and every bond can move as far as the nearest neighbor, namely like n to the minus delta. So this here is, of course, the bar particles. This is the x particles. So that means you cannot build any clusters. And there you see that you excluded this clustering in a very simple way. And then, of course, the proof goes on. And now you finish proving the lemma. And this is not what I want to do. Now, you might ask the question, OK, now it's, uh, this delta is uh, smaller than one third, it would be nice to go to the interparticle distance or below that, right? And now we come to the next step. Now we have proven some convergences in probability with this, yeah, choosing a scale. And now you say you, you would like to go further. You want to improve the cutoff, make a smaller cutoff, and also use, improve the scale where you're working. And there you easily see that things fail. If you make this scale smaller, then you can show, so for the better cutoff, that this theorem again will not hold true because you will have some kind of yeah, collision-like events which from time to time give you deviations which are too large. That's not very surprising. Now you might say, okay, there's two things one can do. Still one can use part three and tune with the D, but interestingly, you making this uh, yeah, convergence stronger, which means a finer a notion of distance, is helpful for the proof. That's a little bit surprising, but if you look at the fact that you want to uh, do a Grönwald lemma and your notion of distance make everything finer, uh, finer then, then this happens on both sides, right? So uh, to control something fine with something finer is something which might have advantages. So tuning with the D it's interesting to go to another notion of distance, for example, L1 distance instead of L infinity is not very helpful. Now, the trick is to go to convergence in probability, and I don't have so much time, but I would like to say a few words here. Now, convergence in probability, from the conceptual point of view, the main distance to uh, convergence in distribution, I would like to um, yeah, explain in the following way that if, if you have different samples, things might be very different if you have convergence in, 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 in distribution. Let me give an example. Th think of a glass table and you throw a dice on this glass table. One person looks at the dice from above, one from below, right? If you think about, if you have the same result of the experiment, they always see something very different. But the distribution, the probability to see a six is the same for both people, right? And this helps a lot, so that means the following. Now, if I have omegas, I don't care if for the same omega, my x, x and my x bar tell completely different stories. I just want to say what is the probability of certain outcomes. Because my initial uh, state is at random anyways. 
And now if you go to uh, convergence and probability and use that as notion, you don't have to follow all the particles in detail. You can say, okay, if I have some event which is bad, some collision events, I can propagate both backwards, both trajectories. I start with different omegas, but as long as the probability for those different omegas is more or less the same, or the probability density in the area is more the same, I get some convergence in distribution. And now the trick is, and this is some outlook I would like to give to go further. Now, if you have a more singular interaction, well, the singular part of the interaction is, of course, a little bit collision-like. Now, if particles collide, it can happen. You have the true evolution, and the collision looks in a certain way. And you have, do I still have some space here, maybe? So particles collide, and this might be the true evolution, and they collide in a certain way, and then after the collision, they fly apart. Now, this x bar evolution might lead to small changes in the effective description. But small changes when you have a collision might lead to very different behavior here, right? And you might then have a strong deviation from the x and the x bar in the future. But if you say, I am not care so much about these notions of uh, uh, yeah, and this uh, probability, you can say this uh, convergence in probability, if convergence in distribution is sufficient for you, you just could compare start, so to say, with the same at this time, make a backwards propagation and say, okay, with, if I have different omegas, so you have an omega and an omega bar for the initial condition, after the collision they lead to more or less the same trajectory, of course you started at different points, but still, if they are close, you get some kind of convergence in distribution. You have different omegas, which tell the same story, but these different omegas have the same probability. Now, we have some results with a PhD student of mine already, which I hope we can publish in some time, some partial results. This is an ongoing project, and now the idea is to do that. And you see here, a notion like the one I gave in the theorem, or also in the lemma, is if you have collision like also my collisions can fail because it might be that the true trajectory and the mean field trajectory are close to each other but if this interaction is too singular that leads to a large deviation so you will not be able to prove this Grünwald type lemma here and then you have a problem and in fact you can show that single particles deviate from each other so the notion in the theorem would in fact uh, you, there would be a counterexample that it holds for more singular interaction. Now, this is uh, the idea now for the convergence in distribution, naming, okay, now we change the omega and only look at, of prob at probabilities of certain events, and this is helpful to go to more singular cases. And here I would like to stop. I think I'm a little bit over time anyway. Any question? Do you expect the, the result to be wrong, uh, even in weak sense, uh, for very singular interactions? That's a good question. I guess in the weak sense, I guess it will also hold for the Coulomb case. But if you do the, the, the theorem I had, if you copy this theorem, where is it? Where's my theorem? Anybody sees the theorem? Here's the theorem. If you use this notion of distance in the, that sense, then you can show that this here uh, the right side will not go to zero, which is not so surprising. I'm not saying it's a surprise, but just wanted to make the statement, of course, if you now want to improve, uh, look at more singular interactions, then this will fail at some time, so you have to do something else, and uh, the something else is to look at another notion of convergence. Actually, it has to be a notion of convergence, which is um, uh, consistent with the notion of root solution that we have for the blood of equation. I think so, yeah. And yes. I think that, uh, say, for a weak solution of the Vladov equation, you cannot control this kind of problem. Um, this I don't get really what you're saying. The point is, if you have delta smaller than one third, this, this is a proven theorem here. And then as a, as a corollary, of course, you, the point is I make statements now not between xn and the solution of the Vladov equation. I make statements comparing two trajectories. And now I understand what you're saying. Okay. Good point. Okay, here on this level I compare my uh, trajectory with the, with, the, with the auxiliary trajectories given by the Vlasov. 
And then, of course, at the end, I want to compare my xn not with another trajectory, but compare somehow with the Vlasov equation. That notion of distance will then be uh, yeah, different, of course, right? Because here it doesn't make, make sense to, to introduce that. And the distance between xn and rho in some Wasserstein distance will for sure be worse than that, right? It, it will inherit more or less uh, this notion of distance. That's the best you can hope for, right? In some sense, right? That the let's say on on that on that scale everything on that scale everything can be true, right? And this of course then limits uh, of course the result on closeness of x n to the solution of the Vlasov. If you do it like I explained here, if you do some Wasserstein distance between the densities, right? There I agree. Yeah. But here the strategy is to look at the trajectories first. And that seems to be a little bit simpler and give stronger results to forget about the density. And the advantage one has here when you do the Grünwald kind of estimate that you have all the particles still under control. And you can name the position of all particles in this in a very fine way. Little l infinity is very sensible, of course, right? In a very sensible way, you control the full trajectory. And that helps to look at the next step, so to say. So, of course, in, 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 in what you presented yesterday, you, you did it stepwise. What replaces the going stepwise here is this ki Grünberg kind estimate, right? So I have a very good control on, on the si system at time t, and that allows me to, con to get a good control on the derivative, so what's happened in, in the next short time interval. And therefore, this, this looking at the trajectories is here kind of helpful, I think, yeah. Yeah, this might be, it might be very naive. Um, you're, uh, you're writing your Newtonian equations with, uh, with, a, with a force directly. Uh, do you gain anything by looking at apps which have potential, or is this assumed anyway? Well, it's, uh, it's, it's not really written as an assumption, but all the forces we have in mind are some forces that can be written down as the convolution of, of a Gaussian, more or less, with, with Coulomb. And then, of course, you have potential. I've never really thought about that, but um, I don't see any point where, where, where it helps that we assume that there's a potential. And everything we have in mind is, well, the forces are quite explicit. So we said it's, it's Coulomb, and inside it's kind of something smooth. And if you replace the, with the something smooth, we don't care anyway what it does. So if you replace it by something which guarantees there's a potential, it would not help anyway here. I don't see any point where this could be helpful. Okay. So in this, in this last case you described, do you also use some kind of process like say this x n bar, like maybe with some couple to some stochastic jump force? Yes, exactly. Exactly. More or less that's the idea, right? Yes. You have some partial results in that direction, so this is more or less work in progress. And um, that's and before in the estimate, you, you, if I understand the argument correctly, you sort of proved that there is not a single cluster, right? Having control. It's so, it's so, no, no, I'm not really proving there's no... I would name it differently. So I control the probability for clusters at later times without having to propagate them backwards, right? In some sense. It's, well, this cutoff at once should remind one at something like a stopping time or so maybe, right? So if, if, if things get too bad, it's game over, and then you count this as one, and then you collect everything bad you've counted on the run. So this is how you could also understand this cutoff. And as long as everything is well behaved, you do your estimates, well behaved automatically means according to this definition, no clustering at time t. And as soon as particles start to cluster, so to say, you stop, you say, okay, this I count now as, as the value one, and for all times, this, uh, you can, could also take the supremum over times if you like, but that's, that's, that's more or less the idea. And um, then, so to say, uh, you collect all these bad events uh, on the run. And, and when you say no clustering, that means really not a single one. It's not that you control the number of clusters that... Well, uh, not really. As I said, you know, we distinguish between the error terms and the propagation of errors. And for the propagation of errors, it will be helpful that you assume you know, it, it's, it's precisely as it's written there. Of course, there could be clustering, but if you have clustering, E is one already, so for the Grünwald, it's, it's, it's not so really bad. And assuming there's no clustering, you do your controls, how that propagates the errors, that's nice. And then you summarize. That's how it works. So I'm not really 
tricking anywhere that I make some assumption which is not there. No, it's just that in the clustering situation, estimates are trivial. That's, that's how it does. And, and uh, you know, there's no free lunch, but that's rather cheap, I would say. <laughs> and uh, the, the, yeah, the trick is that it acts like this kind of stopping time that on, 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 on the run you collect these bad events and control their probability. That's the point. We only collect the probability of those events. We never propagate them back to time equal to zero. That's, of course, very helpful here. Okay, so if there is another question, maybe we should uh, stop. We are already a bit over time. So we'll resume in, uh, in uh, an hour and 15 minutes or so. So let's thank Peter again. Welcome.